Hello and welcome. This is Idea Gen TV. Today, I am honored to welcome our guests, Caroline Daniel and Dr. Rachel Lovis. Welcome. So glad to have you on the program today. Hi, everyone. Uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves really quick. Sure. Uh, I'm Caroline Daniel. I'm the director of academics for the Summer Institute for the Gifted with Summer Discovery. And I'm Dr. Rachel Lovis, uh, and I'm the Director of Academics with Summer Discovery. Perfect. So let's jump right in. Uh, this one is kind of for both of you. How have you seen gender equity evolve in different sectors of academic leadership uh, that you know, you've know you been involved with? Sure, I can go ahead. Um, so my background has been with the K-12 sector, and with gender equity, it's been a predominant field um, with women. And so we've, uh, from the classroom to leadership, you usually see um, a lot of empowerment of women, you know, serving and uh, leading education. Uh, however, with administrative roles, such as principals and assistant principals and executive level leadership, you tend to see um, some of that equality kind of wane a little bit. So in the last few years, it's been, you know, a lot of strides have been made in education to really switch that needle. And um, I myself had the opportunity to move into become a district specialist and uh, move into more curriculum administration and had the opportunity to go into the director of academics role, even here with SEG, which really was a great space to bring that equality uh, even in that in administration field where you tend to see some of that imbalance. Amazing, amazing. And Dr. Rachel. Yeah, so um, a lot of my experience has been um, in higher education as well as the nonprofit sector. Um, and specifically my areas um, in the discipline are in the social sciences where we talk a lot about gender equity and other types of institutional inequality inherently within the discipline. So I definitely seen have seen a lot of attention to gender equity and inequality in higher education um, philosophically. And I think particularly in certain disciplines where um, we're starting to see a little bit more conversation generally across higher education um, about the importance of prioritizing gender equity, not only in those disciplines, um, but within our higher education institutions in general. Um, so I think one of the ways in which we can actually start really advancing this, both in higher education and in the private sector is through um, actually incorporating and embedding these conversations about gender equity into the curriculum so that it's not just isolated in silos in different disciplines, um, but both with, you know, in higher education as well as the private sector of education, we're incorporating curriculum and incorporating a philosophy and an approach in the classroom that's really actually incorporating um, a gender equity lens into the education and into the curriculum. Wow. So, you know, speaking of this kind of transformative role of gender equity in, in curriculums, you know, looking past that even further, Caroline, how do you see gender equality taking shape the next decade with our youth? Sure. I, I would say what we really need to do is forecast how our youth will uh, approach the labor market, you know, in the next decade. So that sense of empowering our students will really lead the way for them really making strides and going toward innovation. Uh, one thing that we've done here at SIG, um, at Summer Institute for the Gifted, is really uh, analyze those, the research behind that, that have been given with leaders in the field that are there, the literature out there, and that they've identified the uh, technolo technological changes and environmental sustainability as two major fronts where a lot of the labor market's going to switch. And so we've really changed our 2022 programming to reflect this with courses on biotechnology and synthetic biology and 
artificial intelligence and really opened up that space so that students can learn and really collaborate with one another. And so when they see their peers, no matter the gender, really uh, offering contributions, exploring their passions, they really get to, uh, it kind of breaks that ice and some of those inequities that we see because they're gonna work alongside with each other and be those innovators in the field in the next decade and beyond. Yeah, and that, that breaking the ice is really so important in, in pre-college programs. Um, and when you look at these pre-college programs, how do you see them advancing opportunities for quality education and lifelong learning, Dr. Lovis? Sure. So um, one of the ways that Summer Discovery is really trying to adapt um, and advancing our attention to um, lifelong learning is through this lens of 21st century, century skills. Um, where we are trying to advance our programming and um, adapt our curriculum in ways that is really emphasizing um, the skills and the coming you know, changes in the labor market that Caroline referenced um, in a way that really empowers students to be innovators and leaders drawing upon these new skills um, that are coming you know, in the new 21st century workforce. So we are trying to implement curriculum and being very intentional about implementing curriculum that builds leadership and empowers students to be um, change leaders and thought leaders in their professions. So the idea is to really appeal to students across a broad number of skill sets and provide them um, with things like technological literacy, which is becoming increasingly important, um, the ability to discern information, you know, in this world of vast information that we have from all different directions so that they are learning these skills even before they get to college to ap apply to any number of um, professional aspirations or careers that they go into. Yeah, and you know, these things you're mentioning, leadership and tech literacy, they're going to be timeless skills that you know, are going to carry on forever. So I think that's so important, really. Uh, Caroline, how can we empower our youth towards a culture of gender equality in education today? Sure. So one thing that we have to remember is being innovators in your field is a huge aspect of bridging gender equality. And a lot of times we think that it happens in college and post-secondary options or beyond, but it really takes place in that K-12 sector. It starts at the elementary school, at the middle and the high school uh, education space where students are being nurtured in their passions and in their strengths, and they, they themselves can identify their strength. And when they do that and have those explorations through summer enrichment programs or through specific courses or different opportunities that they have, they start to see the contributions that they can make in the field when they start getting their degrees and um, graduate degrees, et cetera. So it's really empowering them to understand how they can use their strengths and how they can break societal norms or expectations because they have something to contribute. And it's just nurturing that passion all the way along to then see each other, you know, like I mentioned and Rachel has mentioned as um, just thought partners in the field, collaborators, and then actually producing something uh, innovative and productive for the society that in turn can benefit all. Uh, brilliant, correct. Um, so I, I kind of have to ask, we talk a lot in these interviews about schools and programs kind of adapting their curriculum to fit a, you know, a the pandemic and, and how we've adapted to that. Um, but I have to ask, how do you, you know, see us adapting to curriculums in like a post pandemic labor market? Sure. So uh, again, one of the ways summer discovery is adapting our curriculum um, into our programs over the next several years is again, applying these 21st century leadership skills into um, curriculum that really does emphasize, as I mentioned, this technological literacy. So definitely students, all of us have been forced to, you know, adapt and learn this new technology 
uh, during the pandemic. And we've all sort of had to do it ad hoc and explored the technology to the extent that we're able um, in this sort of last minute, spur of the moment adaptation. So our goal with this new curriculum is to identify the really holistic ways in which uh, higher education institutions, pre-college enrichment programs, general education uh, institutions broadly can draw upon this new sort of embracing of technology and technological literacy to actually make it, um, to use it to its full, fullest extent. So we really want to shape our curriculum in ways where our students are in the classroom engaging with technology through a really experiential type of learning um, that integrates technology inherently into that curriculum. And our goal is to produce students and empower students to then move on to higher education and careers and whatever you know, profession they decide to pursue, where they are not only equipped with those skills to be able to harness the technological literacy, but really act as leaders in the workplace to use this to the best of its ability. And we've definitely been trying to um, model that within summer discovery where we are utilizing the new tools available to us to, you know, sort of practice what we preach and hone these skills so that we are equipped also to then, you know, work with these students who are experimenting and struggling with the same. Um, <laughs> the same um, technological tools that we are. Wow, fantastic, fantastic. Um, and to kind of shift back to our, our topic here, we've been talking a lot about gender equality. What shifts are needed in education to advance gender equality? Caroline? Yeah, I would say, you know, with gender, it's 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 not just gender equality, right? When it comes, there's also age that's there. Within the K-12 sector of education, there's such a, there's so many barriers to this traditional mindset of schooling, you know, within grade levels, within different, you know, it has to be specific ages. There has to be the shifts that need to take place are just more openness to different ways of schooling, different ways of learning um, through online methods, through, you know, different types of coursework, uh, just bringing just a variety into the educational space where, you know, you're not, there's a little bit of freedom, you know, to pursue um, strengths and passions. There's freedom to move as you master and as you show strengths, uh, despite your age. Uh, so there's a lot of barriers that do need to shift, you know, within um, the K-12 sector so that then you start to see gender uh, equalities where there are, you, every, you know, all, whether it's gender or age, you start seeing um, contributions come out earlier, you see, and everyone thriving toward that. A lot of times the system in place kind of is stifling. And so I think more openness on the educators and the educational system, whether it's administration, whether it's educators, and then also on, on, on the parents' end, being open to explore new possibilities, alternative ways of education and schooling. So those are all ways, and it, it, it's a, a big needle that needs to move, but we can start um, small, you know, when folks access programming through Summer Discovery or SIG, they are starting to shift the needle and see education in different ways. And that's how it starts by exposure, awareness, um, access, opportunity, and uh, not just for gender, but, you know, across race, um, across socioeconomic backgrounds, there's so much that um, can shift in the next few years and, and beyond. Certainly, you know, and I love what you said about that shift in having an open mind. I, I think everybody learns differently and uh, certainly having an open mind can, can create that shift. Uh, Dr. Lovis. Sure, so um, just piggybacking on what Caroline had just mentioned in terms of sort of advancing uh, conversations about equity, not only within gender, but across um, all different social sectors. 
And we've certainly seen advancements um, in the past several years, specifically around gender and race, um, with increasing conversation in the public realm that acknowledges that inequity exists. And we've certainly seen, you know, within both the public and private sector, this proliferation of um, diversity, equity, inclusion committees and conversations so that there is generally awareness to help, as you mentioned, open people's minds. But I think we really need to start going several steps further where it's not just having conversations about inequity, but really integrating policies and um, structures within our organizations that embed equity into the organizational structure. So within education, uh, we have this incredible generation of youth that have been exposed to, you know, in particular issues of gender and race inequities, um, but again, across all different inter intersecting social sectors. And I think we have the power within pre-college enrichment programs, within higher education, to not only talk about gender and race as siloed inequities in certain types of social science dis disciplines, but have those conversations and embed that philosophy and value for equity within the classroom, within the curriculum, and moving into the workforce and beyond. So true. You know, it reminds me of the uh, the old adage, talking the talk and walking the walk. And uh, certainly the action, uh, the action there needs to happen. And you both, I'm so glad that we've had you, uh, had you here. And you guys are certainly uh, very actionable and in your causes for education. So thank you so much for being on the panel. This has been amazing. Um, are there any calls for action for our global audience today? I would say, you know, making sure that, you know, for your, your own family, for the families that you influence and the, the sectors that you're in, whether it's business or education or social sciences or marketing, wherever it is, it's just keeping that awareness of gender inequities and racial inequities and how age restrictions can uh, oftentimes stifle. So just being aware, being conscious, that consciousness is so important uh, and just being very reflective of what practices you are implementing, um, that you're leading, uh, the way you approach you know, different situations, all of that is a reflection of the biases that we have inside. And so just taking a minute, you know, or so with teams, with yourself to acknowledge, be reflective. And when you do acknowledge and you see you know, some areas that need to change, that it's, it's actioned out, you know, like um, Dr. Levis talked about actioning it out in curriculum or actioning it out in campaigns or groups or seminars, whatever your space is, is to then do something about it. Wow, well said, well said. Yeah, I would say um, there are sort of several steps um, to action that I would really um, advocate for. And I think it depends on where every individual is at in their understanding of um, how to create quality education and gender equity within it. So I would say, first of all, if there are areas you need to educate yourself about, then seek out that information. You know, try to get up to speed with what those inequities are and what are causing those problems. So I think awareness and taking the initiative individually to make yourself an informed citizen is really the first step. And I think that consciousness is critical. That's really, really important. But I really would encourage people to take it a step further and put that awareness into action. If it's in your workplace, if it's in your school, if it's in with your um, community group, it's taking a step to action to say, here's what I've learned, right? Here's what we are discussing in terms of how we really need to advance gender equity. And let's talk about and actually make some commitments to put this into action in any one of these, you know, organizations or groups. Wow, certainly that's really insightful advice. Uh, thank you so much, both of you, for being here. And uh, until next time. Thank you. Thank you.